a, that's a bit of sad news. A customs officer, I'm told, was a bullet, when well, a shot on the Monjuro Road or in that area today, I don't know why that was happening to this figure. And that's very sad. It's very sad. And this is figure, that shows the seriousness of the situation with this figure. And that is why that situation calls for all hands being on deck. <laughs> not the, not the, the name calling Mr. Speaker and the blaming of people so and the calling Mr. Speaker. Which national security yeah. minister could have called, can stop somebody from behaving in that man's of shooting. No, I don't have that dead. I was dead, I didn't see. That kind of situation is speaker. What you could what you can do is you can improve the crime fighting techniques. You can improve patrols with the speaker. But there is nothing you can do to stop the action with the speaker when somebody wants to commit it. And it's very sad and concerning. And that is why when we play politics to this crime situation. When instead of condemning you look, criminals and the gangs, you try to like shift it know. on politicians mm. because you have a vested interest, huh? because you me. believe I, that no, I want to crime will cause you to get that's votes dead. from the speaker. That is not right. Because what will happen is like if you eh? get into power, the same thing happens with the speaker. So and that is why in opposition, we always took the position of the speaker of not to go inside the crime. But Mr. Speaker is very unfortunate, and I wish the, 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 the custom officer well, and I hope he will get better soon. And I ask God to help his family, to give them strength <coughs> as to endure that calamity, that, that event, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> allow me also to pay tribute to the late Dr. Henry Charles. <coughs> we forgot that, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Henry Charles was the guest speaker <coughs> at our May Day rally in May, 1st of May this year. He was 1st of May uh, Labor Day, Labor Day, 1st of May this year. This year. Yes. He was our guest speaker, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> and Henry Charles, <coughs> Dr. Charles, had just got his PhD, Mr. Speaker. He was a committed fighter and he believed, Mr. Speaker, in, in the cause that he fought for. Dr. Charles was passionate about the youth. Many of my discussions on the youth economy were held with him, Mr. Speaker. And when he died, he was on his way to England, where he had to lecture at a youth symposium for Reading University, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to, on the behalf of the government, the cabinet, my family, and myself, Mr. Speaker, and the residents of Wallwax Road, that is where we were born. We lived and played our 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 cricket in Wallowax Road, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Henry Charles was the organizer of a team called the Enchipo Sports Club. I'm um, a member for, for our fish catch is not bad because we normally beat them. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, and Henry Charles' dream was to return and start revive the Enjibo football team in the form of a youth club, Mr. Speaker. And Henry Charles, and I see the member for Vufort, for Cassius North nodding. Because, Mr. Speaker, even though Henry Charles was an ardent supporter of the Labour Party, he was firm, he was, com he was committed, Mr. Speaker, he never made enemies, Mr. Speaker, never. Henry Charles spoke to everybody. He, he exchanged ideas early, but you, he had his side and you had your side. That's an excellent opportunity. And not like what passes for politics now, Mr. Speaker. Not for not politics, where it's a scorched off policy. You just 
say what you have to say. You just attack people's children, attack their wives, attack everyone in the speaker just because you believe it will give you power. So, Mr. Charles, may the soul of Henry, may the soul of Henry Charles, Dr. Charles, rest in peace, and to his wife Marjorie and his children, I offer them condolences and strength. Mr. Speaker, finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to make a few things Pelosi declare. Because in spite of all that has been said here this afternoon, you will still hear misinformation. In spite of what all was said, all the explanations that were given here, you will still get, you will still admit. So I want to say a few things, Mr. Speaker, just <coughs> to put it on the record, Mr. Speaker, and and end it, put it on the record. It will not end, Mr. Speaker. Let's put it on the record. One, <coughs> the health and security levy will be charged at customs on imported goods. The calculation will be as follows. Cost, customs duty, service charge where applicable, and I just want to tell Mr. Speaker that on all essential goods in the basket, there is no service charge. So for these goods, there will be no service charge, there is no service charge, there is no levy, and there is no VAT on all essential goods in the bell basket. Then, Mr. Speaker, there is the health and security levy, and then there is the VAT. So that's the calculation. It is not charged after the VAT. It's not, it is charged before the VAT. It's not charged after the VAT. It is charged before the VAT. That's where it's charged. On services, Mr. Speaker, it is charged like the VAT, 2.5%. One. Number two, there will be no health and security level levy on foodstuffs, medicines, medical supplies, pharmaceuticals. There will be no health and security levy on these items. There will be no VAT on these items either, Mr. Speaker. Number three, there will be no health and security levy on any items that were VAT exempt or that were zero rated for VAT purposes. There will be no health and security level on these goods. Number four, there will be no in health and security levy on tourism or on manufacturing. There will be no health and security levy on tourism or manufacturing. Number five, there will be no health and security levy on gasoline and gasoline products, on gas. There will be no health and security levy on gas. Number six, there will be no health and security levy on the building materials for which we have just removed VAT. There will be no health and security levy on these items. Galvanized, lumber, plywood, and steel. There will be no health and security levy on these items, Mr. Speaker. Number six. There will be no health and security levy on medical supplies. No, that's Mr. Mr. Number six, there will be no health and security levy on the women products that we spoke of, non-pampers or dappers or things of that nature. There will be no health and security levy on things like bed liners and these kind of things used for medical supplies, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these are the facts as far as health and security levy is concerned. There will be, the health and security levy will not be placed in any lockbox. There is no lockbox. The health and security levy will be placed in a consolidated fund and we will account for it, Mr. Speaker, in the usual process. In the usual process, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, having said so, I want to briefly talk about the use of the word surplus. 
as if surplus is a bad word. Mr. Speaker, it, it is fascinating how people who know better can say to you, oh, you have a surplus to so spend money. Mr. Speaker, this is, I mean, I mean, when I heard the leader of the opposition make the point that, oh, you have a surplus to so spend money. Mr. Speaker, the surplus he is talking about is the, sur the current surplus, you know. Huh? What? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that surplus is, Mr. Speaker, he is not talking about the deficit that he has accumulated, you accumulated, you know, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the country has an overall deficit. I'm not talking about it. But, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you something. Do you know, in times past, in times past, when the economy used to have surpluses, and these surpluses used to be used for reinvestment in capital expenditure. That is how, Mr. Speaker, and that is why the borrowing was so low, because there were surpluses to be used in capital expenditure for schools, for hospitals, for roads, etc. So you had to borrow so much. That's what was wrong, Mr. Speaker. Those were the good old days. But, Mr. Speaker, when he says, and speak about, oh, you have surplus, I mean, Mr. Speaker, the sad thing is that people repeat that. Oh, they say you're doing good, you have surpluses, so reduce gas. You're doing surpluses, so give people money. You didn't, I mean, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is so ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that's what we're trying to do. But, you know, but in giving that knowledge, Mr. Speaker, the propaganda keeps on coming, the propaganda keeps on coming, Mr. Speaker. You have surplus, so give money. You have surplus, throw money in the road. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, $29 million surplus, Mr. Speaker. On the, on, is, Mr. Speaker, it's just, it's good. But we must do much better than that. We must do much better than that, Mr. Speaker. And to do better than that, you have two options. One, you can reduce expenditure, and two, you can increase revenue. What, if you look at the estimates, Mr. Speaker, what are the greatest levels of expenditure in this country? Salaries and wages. Salaries and wages and loan repayments. So what, what do you want me to do? Send civil servants home? That's what you want me to do? No. What you did is we pay them their back pay. Yes. That's what we did. That's what you mean, Speaker. And negotiations are starting. And I can tell you, in these negotiations, we're going to look for fairness, for equality, because we are a government of the people, Mr. Speaker. But we've gone further. We, and I expect to get a report from the minister on the livable wage, livable minimum wage. Because this is the core of, of the government, Mr. Speaker. That's the core of what we stand for. That's what John Charles stood for, Mr. Speaker. That's what he stood for. He stood for promotion of the workers of this country. And when you say workers, they want to tell you, oh, you're only saying about one set of people. That's not true. Workers are workers, doctors are workers, nurses are workers, the same way the people who work in the, in the construction are workers. And we are workers, although we have no union representing us. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, so that's, what, that's, what, that's what it's all about. So what do you want me to do? You have a budget, revenue and expenditure. So you want to have only expenditure, no revenue, and all the time you're spending more than you're making? That's the government he wants me to run? But right now, we have just a slight surplus that doesn't even give us enough to reinvest. We still have to borrow hundred and forty-seven million dollars for investment in capital expenditure by rights a normal surplus what the international financial institutions tell you is you should have a surplus of at least three to four percent on your on your on your current account so you can have something to 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 work with mr speaker but no 
surplus, you have surplus. And Mr. Speaker, the sad thing is that people repeat that, Mr. Speaker. But our goal this time, our goal this time is we are hoping that we can get the budget in a situation where we can improve on the surplus by the same time create a level of services, create a level of infrastructure development so the country can promote and that can advance, Mr. Speaker. That is our objective. That's what we're aiming for, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, that is what we are aiming for. So, the health and security level, Mr. Speaker, will have to be used to pay back the Cayman City loan. And do you know that we thought that the Cayman City loan, the Cayman City expense, was only $11 million? It was not, member for Denry. It was 4.6 million US dollars per year. Multiplied by two years. So Cayman City was 24 million dollars. That's what you paid. That's what you, the listener, that's what the members of parliament, that's what we paid. That's what the taxpayer paid. 24 million dollars, Mr. Speaker. And Locals are the ones who made the transition from Victoria Hospital to OKU. The same way, locals are going to be the ones who will make the transition from the stadium to St. Jude Hospital. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, that this package of incentives that we've passed in the budget and which we confirmed in the House today, Mr. Speaker, does not include the amnesty, the tax am amnesty. The tax amnesty continues until 2024 May. It does not include the It doesn't include, Mr. Speaker, the tax amnesty on all forms of taxation. In the last budget, it was only on income tax. This year, it's on hat, it's on hotel occupancy tax, it's on PAYE, Mr. Speaker, and it's also it's on, on withholding tax, and it's on VAT. So all the gambit of taxes we have, re we have created an, an amnesty on all these taxes, Mr. Speaker. We are going to be, we are going to, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you the total figure of support that we are going to give the private sector because of that, of that amnesty, Mr. Speaker. In terms of forgetting, forgetting, Mr. Speaker, the taxes that are due, 3,169 taxpayers will get an amnesty. The total tax that should be paid, Mr. Speaker, if all things were equal, would be $255 million if the taxes are paid. Penalties, because of non-payment of these taxes, is $53,795,000. The interest that we are waiving is $289,926,000 for all these taxes, Mr. Speaker. So if these taxes were paid, as should be, should have been, we would have collected, we, we, we would have collected $255 million without penalties and interest. And with penalties and interest, we would have, we'd have collected Five hundred ninety-nine million dollars. So what we've saved or what we've removed for the taxpayer, Mr. Speaker, is two hundred eighty-nine million plus fifty plus fifty-three million. Two hundred eighty-nine million in penalties and fifty-three. 289 million in interest and 50, 53 million in penalties, Mr. Speaker. And that does not include a raise on income tax that individual taxpayers owe. And you see that this government is 
will not help in the private sector? You say this government is not trying to stimulate economic growth? You say this government is not helping the balance sheet of the, of, of the private sector, Mr. Speaker? Are you serious? Are you really serious when you say, Mr. Speaker? Which government that has ever given such a broad degree of tax breaks to the population, to all sectors of the population, including individuals? Including individuals. So, but we still believe that that is going to generate a level of activity in the economy. And from the evidence of you got, Mr. Speaker, that activity is being generated, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when they give you the impression that things are bad and gloomy, Mr. Speaker, although, of course, there are some people facing hardship. Of course, there are some people that the inflation has bit them badly, Mr. Speaker. Cost of goods are going up. We know that. We know that, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're increasing our social interventions. That's why we are giving people more help with school books. We are getting more help with educational support. We are getting more people help in, school, in, 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 in food vouchers. That's why we're doing that. We understand, Mr. Speaker. We understand that. And the empathize with them, Mr. Speaker. And this, Chris, and this school program, we're going to see how we can help. That's why we have the housing program that means of health is, 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 is overseeing, Mr. Speaker. But having said so, Mr. Speaker, I was told that there is an organization in St. Lucia, a regional organization, and the performance in St. Lucia was the best in the, in the Caribbean and South America. <laughs> and, Mr. Speaker, and it was said by the businessmen in their survey. So, Mr. Speaker, the signs of economic activity, the signs of the re-engineering of the economy, Mr. Speaker, are there. But, Mr. Speaker, there's, there are two things that we must worry about. Two things. Three things, Mr. Speaker. One of them is climate change. Climate change. And the Minister of Infrastructure and myself had a discussion. I said to him, we have to find the resources for mitigation, for climate mitigation, to avoid the flooding that will take place. That, because rain is going to fall. Whether we like it or not, it's sad. Rain is going to fall. Mr. Speaker, so I said to him, and he had agreed, that we have to have mitigation. We have to ensure that we keep the drains clean. And I'm appealing to the people of St. Lucia to not throw garbage in the water courses. That, that is the simple thing you can do. Don't throw it to get a contract. Yes. Do not show it to get a contract to go and clean it. Please, I'm begging you, don't do it. Do not dump mattresses and air conditioned units and, 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 and old fridges in the in the do not do it. it will not affect me. It does not affect the government. It does not affect the government. It affects you when the rain falls in the fallen one man house. That's what I mean. Please have a little bit of discipline. Have a discipline, because please, climate change. That is why we are doing the giving people incentives for converting from fossil fuels to solar heat into solar power to help our national statistics as it regards to carbon, footprint, etc. That's why we're doing that. And that's how the government policy is holistic, Mr. Speaker. That's a, that's a government that thinks. So we're doing that. We're reducing VAT. I mean, we're removing VAT on these things to encourage people to go into solar energy, Mr. Speaker. So climate change is the problem. The second problem we have to watch, Mr. Speaker, is inflation and supply chain, chain problems. And that inflation, Mr. Speaker, is something that is beyond our control in the region, beyond our control. I was reading somewhere where it said that the cost of poultry feed is going to increase, which may lead to a shortage of poultry in, 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 in the world. How can we, how can we, how can we deal with that? That's not our fault. 
So that's the second point, inflation, Mr. Speaker. And that inflation may cause the price, may cause the price of the price of fuel to go up. No control of us, no control of Mr. Speaker. But why should we do that? We are still subsidizing cooking gas up to today. So we have to look at um, inflation and supply chain issues. The other, issue, the, other speaker, the other issue, Mr. Speaker, is productivity. We have to increase our productivity. We have to sharpen our skills, Mr. Speaker. We have to increase our productivity. We have to understand that a fair day's work and for a fair day's pay. So our, producti our productivity has to increase, has to improve, Mr. Speaker. And let me say something about productivity, Mr. Speaker. I want to applaud the people, the, youth, the, the young people of St. Lucia, for embracing with such with such, uh, we embrace Mr. Speaker, the youth economy concept, how they've embraced Mr. Speaker. I want to tell them, Mr. Speaker, how they've embraced the youth economy concept, Mr. Speaker. The fifth thing you have to watch, Mr. Speaker, is citizen security and crime. We have to be very, very weary, Mr. Speaker, of the crime situation in the country. And that is why part of the levy is going to be used for that, Mr. Speaker. So when people applaud just to get at me, just to get at the members of the parliament and try to draw correlation between crime and us, crime and the government, Mr. Speaker, just for cheap, what you're doing, Mr. Speaker, is you're creating an environment where you are helping people who have bad intentions to do it. Because you are you're feeding it, you're making excuses for them. All kinds of excuses. But on the one hand, you, you attack the social projects, the social programs, you say you're wasting money, you say it's jobs for the boys, you say all kinds of things. And on the other hand, you are creating an environment where even saying to people, that boy, that crime situation, instead of helping the government, Instead of working with the government, Mr. Speaker, you are creating the environment by your words to encourage that kind of behavior. So I'm saying to the people of St. Lucia, be vigilant, Mr. Speaker. I'm saying to the members of, of the police force, be focused. Because the crime situation, we have to get it under control. All the gains that we are making can be eroded in a split second. One, by a hurricane. Or two, by upsurge of crime, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I end by thanking you and thanking the members, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I want to tell the fishermen of the country the same way I made a point. There is no VAT, there is no health and security levy on fertilizer. There is no health and security levy on fertilizer. None. And we are increasing the rebate for fishermen from one fifty to one dollar. From one fifty to two fifty. And we also are increasing the allowance for the teachers to one thousand four hundred dollars. And we're increasing the allowance, the one term, the one time allowance to the pensioners in November by six hundred dollars. And we have promised them that it's going to be a cost of living adjustment for the pensions. Mr. Speaker, the pensioners, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I thank the country for accepting the fact that they must make a small contribution to the health, to the health and security. I want to also thank the Minister of Health and the staff in the Ministry of Health, the members of the St. Lucia Police Force, the members of the Protective Services for the work they, they, they do in trying conditions, in very trying conditions, very trying. There are police stations that need repairs. There are fire stations that need repairs, Mr. Speaker. Very trying conditions. Look at the people, how they work at St. Jude. Very trying. Very trying. But they continue to work for, them, for the country. They continue to work in their professions and they continue to make us proud, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you.